Good evening. Welcome to the MyCP webinar series. My name is Paul Gross. I'm the president and CEO of the Cerebral Palsy Research Network. And I'll be your host tonight for uh, what I think will be a very exciting presentation about non-invasive uh, spinal cord stimulation and the potential impact that can have on uh, spasticity and CP and function. Uh, we've got a couple of guests tonight. Our uh, speakers are Dr. Parag Gad, who is the CEO of Spinex, and Dr. Jason Carmel, who's the director of the Weinberg Family CP Center. And I do believe we have uh, uh, an additional guest, Dana Harmon, uh, who will be joining us as well. So I'm going to get into the uh, usual um, routine. And so if, you're, if you've seen many of my CP webinar presentations, you can sort of tune out for a few minutes where I give an overview of the network. And then uh, Dr. Carmel is going to explain what non-invasive spinal cord stimulation is and how it works. Uh, and then Dr. Gad is going to give us uh, an overview of the trial and the, that they're, um, they've submitted a, a grant for and their preliminary findings from their pilot study. And then we'll go into an open Q&A. Okay, so um, CPRN has changed in the last uh, year and a half. Um, we were born out of an NIH workshop that happened uh, on CP in November of 2014. They came out with five key uh, items that were assigned to people who had attended the meeting. Uh, and those included starting a national CP registry, doing more research, in particular comparative effectiveness research from all the, comparing all the interventions that people were presented with, increasing the study of adults of which the majority of the people that have CP in the United States are, to bring more uh, young scientists into the field and to advance basic and translational science. And CPRM was really founded um, starting from that discussion about a national registry and then really just spread to take, uh, take on all five of these objectives. Uh, also at that meeting was uh, Michelle Schusterman who uh, had a, a blog about CP daily living. And she came out of that with a sense that she really needed to create evidence-based information that was consumable uh, by lay people for the point at which they had either a CP diagnosis or they were under just the, the stress of, of um, caring for uh, people with CP and how to take care of themselves and also to fund important research. So she founded a 501c3 in 2015 called CP Now. And in 2021, uh, Michelle and I who had been working together closely since the founding of her, both of our organizations decided to merge our then four web properties and our programs into one organization under the name the Cerebral Palsy Research Network. Our mission, optimizing the lifelong health and wellness of people with CP and their families through quality research, high quality research, education, and community programs. So some key milestones for us are uh, we launched that uh, evidence-based uh, lay-friendly toolkit in 2015, the CP toolkit, and it's uh, been distributed to more than 4,500 people uh, since it was released, and it was subsequently translated into Spanish and Portuguese. And then in 2017, uh, the well-being guide for caregivers was released. And then in 2020, we released MyCP and added personalization such that it would, based on information you give us about you or your loved one with CP, we serve up uh, personalized information from our website. From a research perspective, we did go make our first priority that, uh, that clinical registry and it was launched in March of 2016. It now has over 7,500 patients in it from the clinical registry. We also went on to launch a community registry to learn about lived experience and pick up patient reported outcomes, not just clinical things that happened uh, at the hospital or in the clinic. That was launched in March of uh, 2019, and that has over 1,500 patients. We also brought together the community, more than 200 people from the community, to set a patient-centered research agenda, uh, which was published in 2018 and really guides our work. We went on to get some significant public funding uh, for our, both for our registry and for our genetics study led by Dr. Michael Kruer at, uh, at Phoenix Children's. 
Uh, and we have four large quality improvement initiatives. These are another way to improve outcomes that work uh, more rapidly than, uh, than a research uh, project, but with a very different approach to changing systems to improve care. And today we've had eight publications. We've had over 27 academic presentations, and uh, we have five manuscripts that are in various stages of writing or submission. Uh, so we've been very productive. Uh, and then we launched a virtual wellness program in June of 2021 and went on to partner with the National Center for Health, Physical Activity and uh, Disability to offer their mentor program uh, to uh, members of the CP community for free. Uh, so what are we? We are a 501c3 since this merger and we are really, we're really the extended community. We are institutions, clinicians, therapists, researchers together with patient advocates, community members, all working to conduct research to improve outcomes for people with CP. We have a data coordinating center that's physically located at the University of Pittsburgh's Epidemiology Data Center. And that's where our clinical and community registries, which are basically databases, uh, that's where those live. And then we, are, we have education and well-being programs. My CP that I mentioned earlier is a big part of this. It is a free personalized web portal that is, sits inside of CPRN.org. Uh, anybody can go to it and it allows you to participate in research through those community, through that community registry by just taking surveys that you can do on your phone or your computer. But it also has private discussions about research and about evidence that clinicians in our network engage in. Uh, in addition to access to personalized web, serve, uh, uh, web resources and wellness programs. Uh, so just to give you a little idea of this registry, which is really a, a, a core enabling technology of what the network does, the clinical registry, i.e. the one that gathers data based on people's visits to a hospital or clinic setting. Uh, on the left, you see gross motor function classification system, which is a really important measure uh, or classification in CP. And it's about how people move around the community. Do they uh, ambulate? Do they use uh, an assistive device? Do they use a wheelchair? And you see the distribution of our uh, of the people in our network back in November 2021, sort of a U-shape. Uh, and then on the right, you see the distribution of age and age bands. And you can see more than 20% of the people uh, in our network are adults. Uh, from the clinical registry. And then those same two data points from our, uh, from our community registry, you see very different distribution because these are the people that are doing things online. They're not physically coming into uh, the, the clinic necessarily. And you also see a much greater age distribution of adults in our community registry. So that's really what CPRN does. We, have, we engage the community in research that matters. On the right there, you see uh, our uh, May 2019 um, in-person uh, research meeting with the, the researchers there. And then we have these educational materials and health and well-being programs. We are spread across uh, the United States. The green pins represent sites that are enrolling patients in the network. Yellow uh, pins represent sites that are in the network but are working through preparing the technology of the registry. Red pins are sites working through compliance and blue pins are sites that have raised their hand and said, we wanna join the network, but it, uh, it takes a process, some process from a legal uh, and technical perspective. Uh, so more than 30 centers in the network today and growing. Uh, lastly, before we turn to the, the uh, content on non-invasive spinal cord stimulation, we exist to accelerate research and improve outcomes. So this is what our research pipeline looks like. On the left, you see uh, ideas that are being percolated within the 30 sites that uh, exist in the network. And then they move through a process of getting approved as a concept, going applying for funding, uh, either internal or external funding, and then getting implemented and executing as a study, and then throwing off evidence or information that we publish uh, and so you can sort of see that how that process works. Uh, so uh, the, the orange ovals are things that we're doing that are quality improvement oriented. Uh, the blue uh, ovals are the research projects that are in process. 
So with that, I'd like to turn it over uh, to Dr. Jason Carmel, who's a pediatric movement disorders neurologist uh, based at Columbia. I don't know where my commas went, but um, he's an associate professor of neurology at Columbia University. Uh, and he is uh, the executive director of the Weinberg Family uh, CP Center at Columbia. And he's also uh, a member of the steering committee of the CP Research Network. So with that, I turn it over to you, Dr. Carmel. Thanks very much, Paul. And thanks, uh, I think all of you have attended Paul's uh, webinars know that he's really energized our field in a, in a very meaningful way. So thanks for hosting this and being, uh, being the leader that we all need here. Uh, let me share my screen here. Uh, all right. How are we looking there, Paul? Good. Okay. All right. So I just have a very quick uh, introduction. Um, uh, why spinal cord stimulation? Um, well, many of you know that um, several of the therapies that we have in cerebral palsy to um, uh, target spasticity uh, are targeting the spinal cord. So on the left is dorsal rhizotomy, where you cut some of the sensory information as it comes here from the leg into this butterfly-shaped uh, uh, thing here is the cross-section of the spinal cord. Uh, and here are electrodes, but you know, if you want to, the cutting of the, the dorsal roots is, is over here. Uh, and then we have uh, baclofen pumps that get inserted and get, deliver the baclofen um, uh, into and ar ar around the spinal cord. So um, we've known for a while that, that treating the spinal cord itself um, could be an effective therapy. Um, sorry for those of you who are eating dinner, who have eaten dinner, but uh, this is a a uh, chicken with no head. Uh, farmer went and tried to cut the, the head off and uh, only got the forebrain and the hindbrain and the spinal cord stayed. And the uh, chicken lived and was able to walk, was able to stand upright, showing that um, a lot of uh, activities that we do can be done just by the spinal cord. So the spinal cord is smart. And potentially if we tap into some of those spinal cord um, uh, nervous tissue that we can get um, meaningful function. Uh, so this again is a cross section of the spinal cord. It's got that sort of butterfly shape in the middle of it. Uh, and what this picture is showing is when we apply electrical stimulation, uh, either directly to the spinal cord or on the surface of the body that eventually gets down to the spinal cord, uh, we're getting this sensory information, and that's true uh, through models and other um, experiments show us that it's really the sensory information as it enters into the spinal cord, eventually going up to the brain to let us know that, uh, you know, the length of our muscle or uh, the sensation on our skin is what's activated by electrical stimulation of the spinal cord. Uh, in in cerebral palsy, spin, uh, spinal cord stimulation is, uh, you know, hasn't been studied a ton, but in spinal cord injury uh, or SCI, it has. And uh, on the left are some of the functions that have been uh, tested. Uh, and in a pivotal trial that was done uh, recently showed that uh, stimulation of the front and the back of the neck delivered arm and hand uh, function for people who've injured the uh, the spinal cord in the neck and the cervical cord. Uh, and so there's been a lot of interest in the spinal cord injury field, uh, but also quite a bit of history in um, stimulation of the spinal cord and cerebral palsy. Uh, Waltz, a, a neurosurgeon operating in uh, the New York area, uh, had a large series, uh, almost 500 people with CP who uh, had some improvement uh, in these uncontrolled studies. Uh, and those are some examples of the function that, that uh, he said these people got. Um, there was a follow-up study based on these exciting results, but uh, a sh very, very small study showed no 
uh, no uh, effect of, uh, of spinal stimulation. And uh, others have showed small case series uh, with possibly improved function, although only one of those patients actually continued to use the stimulator. So it sort of makes one question how useful that was. Um, but there was, uh, there was in, in, uh, an improvement in spasticity in 30 people with uh, CP more recently. Um, so that's, um, so there's a lot of smoke and, uh, you know, the question to be presented at this, uh, uh, webinar is really, you know, um, where, where do we go from here? So the last thing I'll say is that, um, Parag will tell us a little bit about how spinal stimulation is done, but, um, in this study, similar to, uh, the study that Parag will tell us about. Uh, soon, electrical stimulation was uh, applied to the front, to the to the back, and to the front, and uh, stimulated the spinal cord uh, here that controls the circuits for uh, for walking. And when combined with uh, this treadmill training and this robot called a locomat, uh, it improved function. So these were people. Um, who were average GMFCS of, of uh, almost three. Uh, and those who got the combined spinal stim and locomat training had an eight point increase in this uh, gross motor uh, function measure. Um, and uh, those who had a locomat uh, only, only had a one point increase. Uh, and so um, what, that means is that the people who received uh, STEM and and uh, and walking therapy, uh, nine out of the thirteen uh, met that sort of minimally clinically important difference. You know that this had a significant improvement in their lives uh, in terms of walking compared to only two of the uh, people who received only the the mechanical walking therapy. So last slide, just to say that. Um, Spinal cord stimulation has been used for a long time for pain, and there are 4 billion companies who uh, are active in that field, um, in addition to Spinex and um, uh, other companies that are that are targeting uh, non-invasive stimulation and movement recovery. So I think that, um, you know, whenever there's a, a robust um, uh, group of companies, it makes it uh, more likely that we'll get um, therapies out of uh, uh, research laboratories and into the clinic. Um, that's all I have to say about sort of setting the stage. Um, so Parag, God, and I have known each other for many years. Uh, he, like me, uh, you know, was in science, uh, did some foundational studies in uh, laboratory animals, and had, for the past um, at least half dozen years has been a serial entrepreneur trying to take this very exciting therapy um, out of the lab and into people. So welcome, Prague. Thank you, Jason. Uh, hi, everyone. Good evening to you all. Um, hi, thanks, Paul, for putting this together. And it's good to see you all. Um, you can see my screen okay here? Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, we, we, can, we can see it's in, uh, yeah. Perfect. All right, so um, uh, like Jason said, um, I'm, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Spinex, but I uh, have my roots in academic research, just like Jason, and have spent almost 15 years um, at University of California, Los Angeles. So a lot of the work that, that we do uh, at Spinex is driven through you know, uh, strong science um, with, the, with, the, with you know, collaborations with uh, uh, various professors and, and research teams around, around, the, around the world. Uh, we, we, you know, uh, this this sort of gives you just a quick overview of, of what the current standard of care is and uh, how is it that spinal neuromodulation or spinal stimulation uh, is different and, and what is it that it offers that you know actually is demonstrating these these improved results. Um, current standard of care, be it physical therapy, be it Botox, be it uh, rhizotomy surgeries, are primarily treating the symptoms associated with cerebral palsy. Um, if it's spasticity being one of the key uh, you know symptoms. Uh, the spasticity improves with, with you know, Botox, for example, but that, that does not actually result in improvement in voluntary sensory motor function or voluntary movement, the ability to generate these voluntary movements. 
the basic essence of spinal nerve modulation is the ability to tap into the neurons in the spine that control these voluntary movements. And, and the example of, of the headless chicken that, that Jason shared is really uh, highlighting the uh, the automatic nature of movement uh, and the movement control that's present in the spine that allows movement to occur completely independent of the brain. And what spinal neuromodulation does is basically taps into that intrinsic capability to control movement. So, so what is spinal neuromodulation? So um, this is our uh, device, uh, our flagship uh, pediatric device called SKIP. Um, it's a low-cost, wearable spinal neuromodulation device. So we essentially attach little patch electrodes at different levels of the spine. So in this case, as you can see a little schematic of, of a young boy, um, one electrode attached to the neck, one electrode attached to the mid back, and two little grounding electrodes that complete the circuit that are attached to the hips. With this sort of arrangement, we deliver very, very low intensity electrical pulses into your spinal cord. And uh, the, the therapy is completely painless. A lot of the kids, in fact, end up giggling um, uh, because it feels like someone's tickling your back. Uh, for the adults that we and, and these are studies that are extensively done in, in, in adults with spinal cord injuries, for example, and healthy individuals. I've myself been a, a participant in, <laughs> in multiple studies. Uh, it just feels like someone's tapping your back. So it's not a noxious stimulation by any means. It just feels um, as if someone's tickling or, or, or tapping your back when the, the, the electrical neuromodulation is delivered. Um, we do this twice a week, each session lasting for about an hour. And during the session, the, the individual is actively involved in physical therapy. And, and that's really the key to this, is engaging those neurons in the spine while you're performing these activities that are of interest. So by delivering these little low-intensity electrical pulses, what you're essentially doing is activating the neurons in the spine and allowing it to uh, re-establish communication with the brain and allowing the brain to have communication with the muscles that it wants to control. The second being the activation of the sensory component here, where with the activation of those neurons, it allows the sensory information that's coming in from the periphery to be sensed by the brain, giving you a basis of where you are. You know, the, the, the way I'd like to describe it is that the brain and spinal cord act like a, an internal GPS system for us, which tells us where we are in space. If you want to go from point A to point B when driving, you really need to know where you are at point A to get to point B in the most efficient manner. If you don't know where you are, you're just going to go around in circles. And that's really what uh, that GPS system does. And it, it enables that and makes it more uh, responsive and effective. So uh, I'm going to try and show you some videos here of, of some of these uh, improvement in functions. Uh, on the left here is a child with a level four CP in the absence of neuromodulation. And in the same day, when we turn on the stimulation being actively delivered to his spine, and you can see the little wires here that are sticking out from his back uh, and, and neck. Uh, and here the, the dad, his dad is just holding him over the treadmill as a proof of concept to see, is he able to generate these voluntary movements? And as you can see, five minutes apart when the stimulation is actively delivered, and that the key here is the movement that is, is being observed is completely voluntarily driven. If we turn off this, the treadmill and have him sit down, you wouldn't know that the stimulation is on and you wouldn't see any contractions in muscles, unlike what you see with the FES or other forms of uh, electrical stimulation. So the stimulation is completely voluntarily driven. Um, all of the movements being done are completely under his own control. And if you increase the speed of the treadmill, he would walk faster. If you slow it down, he would walk slower. Or if you have him walk over ground, he would walk at this, this, uh, the pace that he is comfortable in. So that's really the key here is that the movement is completely voluntarily driven. But as you know, CP is, is a complex condition. Why we, we often use walking or treadmill walking as a, as a concept to, to demonstrate improvement. But as, since it's such a complex condition with you know, individuals with level five CP, as you can see here as an example. So here's a, a 10, 11 year old girl with a level five spastic quad CP. Uh, and we are testing her ability to hold her head upright. On the left is in the absence of stimulation, and on the right is in the presence of active stimulation. And here the mom is just trying to line her head up to try and see if she can hold it up. And as you can see, when the stimulation was initially off, 
she's she has to try more frequently and is unable to hold her head up. But when the stimulation is now delivered actively, she's able to hold her head up again completely voluntarily, no contractions being seen on the muscles. The other key takeaway from this particular video is apart from the head control, the overall posture and demeanor is calmer. Her legs are in a more comfortable position. Her hands are not you know, swaying around as much. So it's not just one component that you're activating, but the entire system that you're activating. Same when we're looking at uh, an ability to go from a sit to stand position. Um, here, the, the mom's assisting uh, in, in, in that particular maneuver and uh, she's supporting her, her knee to lock her knee with her own right leg. And on the right side, when the stimulation is actively delivered, you'll see in about 10 seconds, she'll take her support off and is able to, the child is able to voluntarily uh, you know, bear her own weight. Again, this is the first time that we've ever uh, delivered a, a, a spinal needle modulation to this particular child. And the, uh, the ability to go from being uh, able to stand for a few seconds to being able to stand for about 30 to 40 seconds continuously uh, is, is, is being observed. So this is the, the, the active neuromodulation component. Um, but what we, what we really are excited about is the ability for the brain and spine to induce what we call as neuroplasticity. Um, here's an example of um, Bennett, uh, Dana's son, at home in the absence of stimulation before and after eight weeks of therapy. Bennett's been involved in our studies. Um, uh, he was involved in the study sometime last year. And uh, this is a couple of videos that Dana, Dana shared with us at home in the absence of stimulation. And as you can see, uh, in the first, in the left uh, side, uh, in his walker, he's attempting to uh, take, take steps, but is, is unable to get out of that you know, initial position. But on the right, he's freely moving and is, is able to take these steps um, with just the posture being controlled by, by his walker. So this is really the key neuroplasticity that's being demonstrated, uh, that's being induced in the brain and spine, allowing you to retain that improved level of functioning, not just when the stimulation is being actively delivered, but also at home in the absence of stimulation. And this is after just eight weeks or 16 hourly sessions uh, of, of therapies, the improved function that we are observing. So based on these results, <clears throat> our, our first um, in human study was published earlier this week or last week now, uh, where we demonstrated in 16 children with um, CP ranging from uh, level one all the way up through level five, an improvement in function on the GMFM 88 scale that is um, significantly higher than what's been demonstrated both with standard of care as well as with uh, you know, other forms of literature. Um, and he, this is just a, a busy slide here showing uh, the, the distribution of changing GMFM 88 scores across various age groups. And each of these data points here represents one child that was in the study. Uh, and as you can see, the distribution here is, is fairly you know, widespread where it, uh, we, we see an improvement greater than five points, which is the clinical significance that we are looking for uh, in all of the children that were, were tested. Uh, essentially demonstrating that the improvement that we are observing is not necessarily limited by age or by GMFCS level. Uh, the, the, the change that is possible uh, with the average change that we observed was about 13 points in the GMFM scale where uh, across the you know, various levels, and that was consistent irrespective of whether you're a level one or two or a level four or five. In this particular study, we didn't really have anyone with the level three. So, uh, you know, we're still missing some data points here. And it's a relatively small study in terms of sample size of 16 kids. But you definitely see uh, a wide range of improvements uh, across the board, across age groups. So in terms of, you know, where we are um, and, and where we're headed, we've been actively pursuing cerebral palsy and, and, and non-invasive spinal, spinal nerve modulation now for about uh, two years. Um, and we have reached a point where we have uh, completed sufficient studies to demonstrate and convince the FDA that this is a, um, a, a, a trial that's, that needs to happen and a device that needs to be brought to the market. We have met with the FDA now on two occasions um, and have had what's called a pre-submission meeting, 
that uh, gives them, you know, where we discuss with the FDA what their expectations would be from us in terms of running a, a pre-order trial for, um, uh, for FDA clearance. And so far, what we have agreed upon is a trial that would be uh, about 44 participants that would be included in the trial, uh, where they would receive eight weeks of active therapy. Um, <clears throat> the trial would be conducted at about six centers uh, around the country, with uh, you know Jason being one of the one of the sites to conduct the trial, uh, and we'd be looking at the GMFM eighty eight as our primary outcome measure, um, and uh, spasticity as being the secondary measures. Uh, this would be conducted in uh, in pediatrics, so children ranging from ages two to eighteen, and GMFCS levels one through five. And this is something that uh, we've already discussed with the FDA and have uh, reached an alignment with them and are looking at conducting this trial uh, beginning sometime next year. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to hand over to, to Dana and have her share uh, you know, her perspective on uh, you know, what, what she observed with, with Bennett, not just while he was actively in, in, in the trial, as well as you know, what she observed at home in the absence of stimulation. Parag, so, could I, before Dana speaks, could I ask you to do one thing? Yes. I, I think for those of us that are immersed in this, the difference between what the GMFM is and the GMFCS is clear. It might help um, if you or Jason can describe the relationship between GMFM and how it was used to get to the GMFCS. Sure. Uh, Jason, do you mind if I take a shot first? And... Please. Yep. So, uh, so GMFM eighty eight is a uh, is a series of tests that are done uh, with an individual. Um, with, it consists of eighty eight different maneuvers um, uh, that are broken down in five different dimensions. Uh, each dimension consisting of uh, specific tests that are done for um, upper extremity function or posture or standing or or sitting. Uh, and so each of these dimensions really focuses on one aspect of GMFM. So GMFM stands for cross motor functional measure with 88 tests being done within that particular um, uh, dimension, within that particular component. Uh, it, it gives you an, uh, uh, an assessment, and this is the gold standard for cerebral palsy at this point, that demonstrates the level of voluntary function that the person is capable of, um, of, of performing um, at that particular age. And now this has been extensively studied. It was, it was built based on the Canadian standards uh, by Can Child, and now it's been extensively studied for various age groups. And you have a, a fairly good understanding of the level of function expected based on age as well as GMFCS level. GMFCS is gross mode gross, uh, functional classification scale. Um, uh, where it's a, a, a breakdown of the level of severity of cerebral palsy, where uh, it's divided into five different scales, level one being the least severe and level five being the most severe. Um, they, the, the two are um, you know, uh, related with the, uh, the GMF, F, GMFM 88 having the highest scores for GMFCS level ones and decreasing with increasing GMFCS levels. But there's still, you know, gray areas between, you know, levels two and three, uh, based on, uh, you know, as you transition from one to the other. The classification is based on, you know, gross motor of observations and specific tasks that a person is capable of doing. Um, so they, they always ends up being in the gray area between, say, a level three and four. Uh, the, the the scores may vary uh, a little bit, especially for ones that are, um, as a child is is growing and is able to uh, naturally gain some additional function. Great. Thanks. I just uh, I just thought that might help people understand when we're talking about both these terms. So, so why why GMFM eighty eight is important is uh, at this point it's really the gold standard for measuring gross motor function and it, it it's a good and clean way to demonstrate the level of improved function possible based on um, uh, you know maneuvers and and tasks that you expect the child to be doing. Yeah. Dana. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Dana, and my son Bennett has been a participant in the SpineX trial. We feel so fortunate to have been a part of it. Um, he's three and a half now. He has spastic quad cerebral palsy. And as Prague mentioned, we have gone through two rounds of the trial. Um, with SpineX. The first one, Bennett was two years old, 
And that's the before and after video that Parag showed you, um, which was really exciting. I would say after that first round, the biggest um, pronounced difference we saw was in Bennett's gait um, and the improvements yeah. there of him wow. initiating steps. Um, and also, you know, initiating the steps on his own, getting his knees up higher and also pushing through his heels. Started rolling. Oops. Um, and as Prague mentioned also, we saw carryover with that. So it wasn't just during those eight weeks um, while we were using the device, but it has carried on um, as he's continued in his, I mean, he still does his regular PT and OT, but we saw those improvements carry on in his gait um, from when we began the Spinex trial. And then we did a second round about a year later when Bennett was just three years old. Um, and I would say in that second round, you know, we still had those improvements in his gait, but really the big difference the second time around was seeing an improvement in his core strength and his head control. So he still needs some assistance in sitting, but he's able to sit up straighter. He can look around to see, you know, whatever he wants, if he wants to watch his iPad or he wants to see what's going on in another room. It's just really made him more aware of his surroundings, which is also um, we're seeing more cognitive improvements as well um, of him being more responsive to us. Um, and then I would say another thing that has improved after that second round is along with that core strength. He's using his arms and hands more to be able to reach for things that he wants and grasp a little bit longer. Um, and we're seeing him roll, which is really exciting for Bennett. He, you know, he's down on his play mat playing a lot. And in the past, he's not able to get over to the toy that he wants on the other side of the mat. But now, and again, talk about carryover. We have, we've been out of the study for quite a while now but he continues to be able to roll independently, which is really obviously satisfying for him that he's able to get over to that toy that he wants instead of having to you know, cry out for me to come help him with it. So I would say you know, overall the trial has made him stronger in his core and with his head control. It's definitely helped with his gait, making him more independent, being able to get from point A to point B in his gait trainer and with rolling. Um, so we're just very grateful to be a participant and we're so excited for others to be able to use this device and, and have it help you know, more people within the CP community. Thanks so much, Dana, uh, for, for that. You know, the experience of going through the trial is, is really critical. Um, so, there's been quite a few questions uh, in the chat. Uh, feel free to add yours. Uh, let's um, let's dive in because there's a lot. Uh, uh, any research on how this will help if a person with CP has had cervical stenosis? So cervical stenosis is narrowing of the spinal canal, uh, typically in people with uh, who are older, um, and. Uh, there's no knowledge that I have. We've been doing some spinal stimulation in people undergoing uh, cervical stenosis surgery. Um, uh, but, um, you know, to my knowledge, there hasn't been any trials of uh, adults with CP with uh, non-invasive spinal stim uh, and, uh, and therefore no information about uh, cervical stenosis. Do you have any other information, Parag? Um, just one uh, adult with CP that we have we've worked with so far, and uh, we saw we saw positive results, um, and that was just an acute study of uh, you know one session. Um, so I think at this point we don't have sufficient information to really have uh, uh, you know a, a strong evidence one way or the other. Uh, so following on that, is this available to adults with spastic CP? Um, uh, I don't know. Is there is do you have a trial open in in through Spinex? Uh, so 
we we are we are uh, we are planning our next trial starting early next year and um, i think uh, one of the focuses there may be on adults uh, in the adult population so uh, uh, it definitely is an area of interest for us and i think uh, we definitely will be focusing on that uh, it's just because of how um, you know fda expects a very narrow window and of a narrow spectrum um, when we send the trial to them uh, we have not been doing enough uh, adult studies but it definitely is something that we will be tackling Based on studies we've done in adults with spinal cord injuries, uh, we expect um, similar results in adults with CP as well, but it's just that the study has not been done. Uh, can this be used in people who currently have baclofen pumps? In, in theory, yes, but uh, uh, so there are, I guess, two different ways to look at it. Uh, one is um, mechanically or, or electromechanically, would, it be, would, would you be able to use it? Um, the answer is yes. Neurophysiologically, the baclofen and the neuromodulation works in opposite mechanisms, where baclofen ends up you know, inhibiting a lot of the activity and we're trying to activate and inhibit the activity. So since they work in two different ways, uh, there's always a challenge in balancing those two. So that is something that will need to be kept in mind as to uh, how are you, uh, are you able to wean off the baclofen dosage while the, 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 the stimulation is being delivered so that you can then you know, get the maximum benefit. But just from a logistic perspective and electromechanical perspective, uh, yes, the two, two devices can function simultaneously. Was physical therapy and medication included in this trial? Yeah. Uh, so physical therapy is always included. So this it's not a, a switch that you flip and you expect improved results. Uh, while the trial is ongoing, the, the eight weeks and the, the, the weekly, bi-weekly sessions, the, the children are actively involved in, in physical therapy uh, over a period of about 60 minutes. Uh, medications were not changed. So children that had certain medications for um, you know, maintenance of quality of life or improved function were, were sustained. We did not modify any medications for them. Great. Uh, is the trial uh, op still op uh, taking participants? Uh, we have one trial ongoing right now at, at our Spinex facility where we have six children um, uh, with different levels of CP that are uh, currently undergoing a 16-week uh, uh, protocol. Um, and we do uh, plan to begin a second round of studies sometime uh, early next year in the January, February time window, uh, where we will be focusing on a slightly different modified uh, pattern. Either it will be adults with CP or a longer uh, you know, uh, therapy period. So yes, we are still actively enrolling. Uh, I'm gonna put down our email in the chat here. And if any of you are interested in participating, uh, please feel free to send us an email and we will add you to our uh, patient um, database. So the question about duration came up. Is eight week duration of the trial an arbitrary cutoff? And is there any reason to believe that further gains could be made from longer periods of treatment? So the eight week was primarily set based on um, the level of improvement that we observed and uh, evident that the improvement sufficient to convince the FDA that um, this is a, a clinically significant improvement. Um, it's it's uh, in that sense it's it's arbitrarily set. Um, it by no means means that the level of improvement possible is plateauing at eight weeks. Uh, comparing eight weeks versus 16 weeks of, of therapy that we are you know, currently doing a small pilot on, we see the, the, the children being more functional at 16 weeks compared to the eight weeks um, you know, when they were tested previously. So yes, if, if you continue therapy and continue to uh, you know, uh, be involved, you definitely see the improvement getting stronger and better. Uh, does the... Does the spinal cord stimulation activate the sensory or motor nerves? And are there any side effects? So side effects, um, none that have been observed so far. Uh, in We have done this in adults uh, as well as in our children. I would say about 200, 250 odd individuals, um, you know, as young as two years of age to as old as about 75. And we have not seen any, uh, any adverse events. Uh, the only... Um, uh, in, side effect would be redness of the skin at the site of electrode, um, which goes away in about five, 10 minutes. And that's very similar to any stimulation FES, uh, TENS unit that, that you may have been exposed to. Um, what, uh, to for, for the sake of complete transparency, what's not um, comfortable is the, the part where you take the electrodes off. 
um, and that that's the most uncomfortable part of of uh, the 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 procedure. It's just because it's a sticky surface, and you got to take it off. And we're trying to come up with ways in which we can mitigate that as well. Um, uh, does it activate the motor or the sensory? Uh, it does both. Uh, the improvement that you observe is uh, a combination of the improvement in sensory motor function. So it's it's it always does both, and they both go hand in hand. You can never have improvement in the motor without the sensory portion. And that's really the driving factor here is how much sensory function can be improved. Uh, and will the planned trial be open to children who've had SDR, selective dorsal rhizotomy? Um, so for the planned FDA pivotal trial that I mentioned to you at the various sites, it won't be for children with SDR. Um, and that's just because we don't have enough evidence in the SDR population just yet. We have done a small pilot of two children so far where we have observed improvements in function three years after STR in, in, a, in a couple of boys. Um, and we're still <clears throat> getting a better understanding of how does spinal neuromodulation interact with a nervous system that has had an STR. Uh, so we would probably take on certain um, pilot studies internally first before doing a multi-site pivotal trial for FDA approval. But that is something that uh, is in the pipeline for us uh, next year. Uh, there's a question about the interactions of medications, specifically baclofen, with spinal stimulation. So uh, the, the the two uh, end, end up being uh, you know opposite in nature, where baclofen ends up uh, inhibiting activity that is of interest, and the stimulation is trying to excite and increase that level of activity. So uh, that's that's how they, they do uh, work in opposite ways, which is why um, we try and uh, avoid uh, you know having baclofen actively on while the stimulation or their part of the trial. Okay, there's a specific question about the availability at local sites. I suggest maybe you contact Parag at the uh, email address that he uh, provided. Uh, so this is a question about the use for spasticity. Uh, what is the mechanism? What is the mechanism of this? Um, does it interfere with normal signals from the brain? So the uh, one way to explain the, the effect of spinal neuromodulation is essentially uh, reestablishing and normalizing communication between the brain and spinal cord. Um, so so uh, let, let's let's if you look at the two questions together. Um, spasticity is, is primarily occurring because the communication between the brain and spine is, um, uh, for lack of a better term, messed up. Uh, and, and muscles are firing at the same time, causing spasticity to, to occur. When we deliver the neuromodulation and in, get the children involved in, in the physical therapy, the communication between the brain and spine is more normal, uh, allowing the muscles to fire in a very, uh, in, a, in a pattern that is it is as expected. And we see that based on EMG studies that we've done in these children, where muscles that are uh, antagonistic or that are supposed to be firing in opposite natures uh, start firing together. But when we deliver the stimulation, they start going back to that normalized pattern there where they are firing in that opposite pattern where one is on, the other is off. And one is on, the other is off. With that improvement, uh, you see a direct impact on spasticity where the spasticity, spasticity scores and overall measure is also decreasing. So we see improvement of spasticity as a byproduct of improved functionality rather than you know, the other way around where spasticity improvement then improves voluntary function. Uh, okay, can the device be used all day? Um, potentially, yes, uh, but we, have not, uh, we don't know the impact of um, long-term use of the stimulation in terms of functionality. Is it safe? Yes, it is. We have, we have, we have had this on in adults for uh, up to eight hours a day um, and have not seen any adverse events. Uh, but is there a direct translation of using it all day in terms of improved function? Uh, anecdotally, the, the answer is yes. Uh, we just don't have enough evidence to know what that improvement is and if it's worth having it on eight, 10 hours a day versus one hour a day. So I think that's a, a, a question of a, a balance between improved function and the effort being put in. Uh, is spinal stimulation uh, only being used to assist children who walk or are there uh, children, uh, is it being used for children to control spasticity uh, for those who can't walk? 
So, uh, like I said, walking ends up being a good um, metric to demonstrate improvement, but the improvement that we're looking for is overall across motor function, uh, across the board, improvement in trunk function, head control, uh, uh, core strength, uh, voluntary movements of the limbs um, across the board. So, so we're not limiting it to walking only. Spasticity ends up being a, a, an improved byproduct of improved function. The moment voluntary movement improves, that has a direct impact on spasticity and improvement in spasticity, spasticity scores. Uh, Dana, the next question is for you. Uh, I'm so happy you saw improvements in your son. Are there any improvements that you observed in your, uh, in, that you observed in the study that have diminished over time? Um, I, I do not feel that anything has diminished over time. I mean, obviously after we finished the study, we went right back into our regular PT, OT, other therapies that Bennett's doing and getting him up and moving his body. Um, and we, we feel that he has maintained those improvements from the Spinex study and then is able to build on those. Um, with his other therapies. Uh, another longevity question: um, How do they? How do the scores change over time, and what is the timeline? I guess that's for Prague. Yeah. So, uh, so the improvement that we've seen, and I, again, I take Bennett as an example, Dan, if you don't mind. Uh, in the first, uh, you know, phase that we, he was involved in, we saw an improvement of about uh, ten to twelve points in the GMFM eighty-eight score, and that's within a period of about eight weeks. And when you know we we had uh, Bennett come back for a second uh, study, um, the the gap there was, I believe, about six to eight months, and uh, the level of uh, over that period of time. Uh, the scores that we the, the change in scores that we observed was did not occur. He 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 was able to sustain that and even had a couple of points improvement in the GMFM eighty eight at the baseline for the second trial compared to the start at the end of the first trial. So so that level of uh, the ability to sustain that and even have a couple of point change uh, is is really exciting to see that the as long as you're involved in uh, active therapy and physical therapy you're able to sustain those improved functions. Uh, whether that sustains for two years, three years out, I think that that that's an unknown at this point. But at least for a few months post uh, the initial therapy, you definitely are able to sustain this improved function. I'll just editorialize that. Remember that um, these are in you know particularly like a young child like Bennett. The the normal curve is mm -hmm. is of gaining uh, function on the GMFM. Uh, so um, you know I, I think. Part of the importance of having this uh, blinded pivotal trial is is to see um, whether the exper the changes experienced in the in the group with stimulation whether those differ compared to the control group. Um, uh, does the stimulation change the velocity dependent spasticity? Yes, uh, the, the the spasticity improvement is is observed across the board. And there's and there's been a few studies um, in other areas as well in spinal injury and MS um, that specifically look at um, uh, rate dependent decrease, you know, uh, in tone. Uh, has the device been FDA approved or still under investigation? It is an investigational device, and the pivotal trial uh, that we hope to conduct next year would be intended towards uh, you know getting FDA approval. Um. I'll give Prague a break for a second. Is the principle similar to the TENS stimulator used for the treatment of back pain? And, and the answer is no. Um, here are the ideas that we're actually trying to engage the, the nervous system. Um, and so putting it on, you know, uh, directly over the location of the spinal cord is, is actually trying to affect the nervous system as opposed to the, um, uh, you know, the either peripheral nerves or, or direct stimulation of muscle. Um, let's see. Uh, is your child canceled out of the study if you're already doing spinal stimulation? No, you're not. You're still, you're still eligible for, uh, you know, future studies, uh, irrespective of the current uh, studies you're involved in. Is spinal stimulation affecting the central pattern generators? 
at a, at a high level, yes, uh, we we are tapping into the into neurons, the CPGs uh, that are that are being controlled. Um, but but CPG activation is generally independent of the brain; it's voluntarily driven. Uh, in in this particular case, we are trying to uh, get voluntary control, uh, you know, being being the driving factor rather than external source being the driving factor. So, so that's why, it, it, like I said, at a high level, that is the the the, the source of activation. Uh, so central pattern generators are the ones that that uh, as as Prague said can uh, generate uh, movement like in that uh, chicken that I showed you uh, independent of any brain input. Um, Jason, uh, can I can I interrupt for a quick yeah. second just to do a little time checking because we're about to be at the end of our time, but we obviously have struck a a very uh, interesting chord and people have a lot of questions. I want to check in with you and Parag and want to know if you're okay going a little longer or um, if not, I'm going to ask a last question for you. What what do you guys feel like? Parag, um, are you okay? You're on the hot seat. Okay, <laughs> Jason, you're at home on the East Coast. Yeah, I'll get, let's do, let's, let's give it 10 more minutes and then, um, and then we'll call it. And then I think uh, info at spinex.co.co is the, and so, uh, you know, feel free to address any uh, uh, other questions to, to Barag there. So since we don't think we, I don't think we're going to get through everything. I'm going to ask one question. We have a lot of adults on this call. There's, it's been expressed, you know, I hope this is available for adults. You mentioned a little bit Parag about why you started, where you started. Can you sort of crystal ball a little bit and say, like, if this is successful, I mean, you're a startup, you can have to start somewhere and get a beachhead. What's the likely scenario in which you would move into testing in adults and, and whatnot, if, if all goes well? If, if all goes well, uh, I would say we would have a, a, a very focused adult-based study sometime next year uh, that will uh, that'll look at... Um, uh, similar patterns, uh, similar procedures in, in the adult population and the level of functionality. Again, uh, it, it would need to be within the adults. We need to carve out a, a, a focused area and then uh, look at how, how this impacts the adults uh, with that, within that segment. Um, but uh, I, I, would, I would say if all goes to plan and, and funds and resources are made available and we're able to generate the funds, uh, we would have the first pediatric device on the market by 2024. Um, and the adult study is starting next year, um, leading to expansion of the indication and the de device approved for adults by 25, 26. Okay, thank you. I'd also just say that the majority of spinal stimulation studies have been done in adults, but with different yes. indications. <laughs> right. Uh, so spinal cord injury, MS, uh, Parkinson's. So, um, you know, I think that once proof of concept has been done in CP, let's say the pediatric uh, study, that um, these methods have been done a lot uh, and much more in adults. Um, so, so, so just, just one other point, just quickly regarding the adults, there's so many of them here and, and are interested. We have one trial right now ongoing for the adult population, and that's an FDA trial at about eight or nine sites around the, around the world, including uh, Colombia with, with Jason being one of the sites, um, uh, where we're looking at improvement in uh, bladder function for adults with stroke, SCI, and MS. And we're hoping that uh, our device, uh, which is what I'm holding up in front of me called SCONE, uh, would be approved uh, by the FDA um, in, in, in 2023, maybe 2024. So that's already an ongoing effort. We have put in a fair amount of resources towards it. Um, so this device would be the first device to, that we would bring on the market before the pediatric device. Uh, so it, it, uh, while it doesn't directly focus on the cerebral palsy indication, uh, it is an adult device that would be approved before the pediatric device that comes out and would be potentially available for adults with CP as well that they could purchase uh, and use for themselves. Um, good. Maybe there's a few different questions about physical, about various therapies, um, physical therapy, um, uh, speech there, you know, would speech therapy ever be uh, involved? So talk to us about that, Parag. 
So, so far, because of how, uh, uh, unfortunately, the, the FDA looks at uh, outcomes in a very narrow spectrum, we've had to limit it to just, uh, you know, gross motor function. Uh, but there have been anecdotal evidences on improvement in, you know, speech, for example, and and verbalization, and 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 how much and what what a child can say. And I, I think you know Bennett had a similar observation, and Dana can share some of her insights as to things that Bennett started saying. But uh, definitely, uh, that is uh, where an area where we we have seen improvements. Uh, and something that that uh, we would be, uh, you know, looking at expanding our indication uh, once this first indication has been approved. And Dana, maybe you can share your uh, feedback on Dana Bennett. Sure. Um, we we haven't seen, you know, a lot of improvements related to his speech. I will. I mean, he became more vocal. I'll say, expressing himself. Um, but as far as actual, you know, verbalizing words, we didn't see that. But what we did see um, kind of anecdotally was him being able to eat um, orally more than he was before. Bennett is G-tube fed. Um, and we did see an increase in his oral intake. I mean, he, he's able to eat pureed foods. Um, and so during the time while we were participating in the trial, we did see an increase in how much he could eat. And, you know, I think that probably had to do with that strength and core and that head control. Um, he had a little bit more stamina as we were feeding him. Great. Right. Um, well, I think, Paul, I think we're, maybe we'll leave it there. I, I put my, uh, uh, email address into the into the chat. Uh, Parags is there. It is .co, not not .com. Um, uh, and um, uh, so those are the ways to reach us. And I'm, I'm sorry that we didn't get to everybody's question. I'm so glad that there was uh, such interest in this. Uh, Testament to how much interest there is. I mean, this is a big crowd and. Uh, People have been very engaged. You all have been very generous with your time. Uh, Dr. Gad, best of luck to you on your uh, on your trial. Um, Dr. Carmel, I, I you know, wish you best of luck as a site. And uh, Dana, thanks for joining us and sharing your personal experiences. That's great. Um, anyway, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. We will post the uh, webinar um, in the next 24 hours or so. Uh, have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks, Paul.